Welcome to PRI's podcast. I'm your host, Romina Itchon. In this episode, our guest is Ian Adams, Associate Vice President of State Affairs at the R Street Institute, a think tank based in Washington, D.C. Ian is at R Street's Sacramento office and follows insurance regulation, transportation, and technology. In this podcast, Tim and I, PRI's Director of Communications, and I chatted with Ian on the recent bills coming out of Sacramento in the wake of the Northern California wildfires. Unfortunately, as Ian explains, many of the proposals put forth do more harm than good. Thanks for listening. Welcome to PRI's podcast, Ian. Thank you for having me. Let's start off with, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about the R Street Institute and the work that you do in California nationally. Absolutely. So the R Street Institute, we are a free market think tank. We're about five years old at this point, and our motto is free markets, real solutions. And so nationally, we have 50, 55 staff. We're based out of Washington, D.C., though we have for a long time focused on on state matters just because we think the states are where really exciting developments happen and a lot of a lot of think tanks based in Washington DC overlook the good work that is done out in the states and so we have uh, been in California for about three years now I'm here along with my colleague Stephen Greenhut and much of what we focus on has to do with financial liberties insurance regulation occupational licensing and, and more recently on criminal justice reform and other things of, of that ilk. So we're, we're happy to be here and happy to be uh, spreading the light of liberty out west. So Ian, we always like to give our listeners a little glimpse into what makes our guests tick. So we've known one another working in the legislature in our, in our past lives. For our listeners who, who don't know you, tell them a little bit about your background and how you got into this wacky world of uh, free market think tanks. Absolutely, Tim. And I should say uh, we did. We first met in the assembly I was a, an assembly fellow going on a tour of, I believe, the uh, Assembly Republican Caucus's communications unit when yes. we first met, and you were still in the glow of a recent San Francisco Giants World what Series that? victory, right? And as a St. Louis Cardinals fan, I was I was crushed yes. uh, by that. <laughs> but uh, I I came to think tanks after having completed law school. I knew that I did not have a great interest in practicing law. I was very interested in policy, and so I went to work in the legislature, uh, then went over and worked for a trade association in what Sacramento affectionately refers to as the third house. And from there was was given the opportunity to interview with R Street and began an, uh, a relationship with the, the employer that I currently have. And so it's been, it's been great ever since. But of course, um, like you, Tim, I don't think you ever expect to go into working for a think tank while working out west simply because uh, between our two organizations and potentially just a couple of others, there aren't really a lot of opportunities for folks to do this kind of work. So I'm, I'm really grateful to be doing it, and it's been a lot of fun. Ian, one recent focus of your work has been the response to California's devastating wildfires. You recently wrote an op-ed for the Sacramento Bee talking about a proposal by Senator Ricardo Lara that would subsidize the insurance costs of property owners in areas prone to wildfires. Describe to our listeners what this proposal would do, and why do you think it's a bad idea? Yeah, Senator Ricardo Lara Lara uh, has introduced Senate Bill 824 uh, in consort with some supporters in Placer County, which is a wildfire prone area, is in his words to apply the principle of charity to, to ensure that there is stability within the market for fire insurance with, uh, within California. His concern, of course, being that in the wake of wildfires, there will be a shortage of insurance and therefore there will be no um, knock-on impacts in the residential uh, market for homes. So the bill, what it attempts to do is three big things. Uh, the idea is to prevent insurers from non-renewing policies in the wake of a wildfire. It, it also prevents insurers from increasing their rates after a wildfire, and then also requires that they offer mitigation discounts. And while facially these are all positive, developments, of course, we realize that there are costs to 
everything that you do. And the whole idea with insurance is we're part of a larger pool and that the rates that we pay reflect the risk that we present. And so one of the challenges associated with creating new strictures on the way underwriting and rating takes place for insurers is that it functionally forces a subsidy on those who are in lower risk areas. So that is to say, if if you if you live in an area where wildfires aren't all that likely, say downtown San Francisco, you will be paying more on your property insurance than you otherwise would in the event that this bill were to pass, simply because if, if insurers are forced to continue covering that risk to remain solvent and to remain actuarially sound, they have no choice but to charge other people higher rates. And we think that's a problem because as weather patterns change, as the climate changes, we are seeing risks go up. And it is important that people come to understand the true danger that they're in. And one of the best ways of communicating that is through prices, through the market mechanisms. And so that's why we're very concerned about this proposal. As we know, you know, when there's something like a natural disaster, a wildfire, an earthquake, you know, there's always the old adage about lawyers being ambulance chasers. Well, I think we could really say politicians are ambulance chasers. So there are certainly a whole bunch of other ideas being kicked around in response to the devastating wildfires across the state this year. Talk about some of these other proposals that are on the table and your concern with how Sacramento's wildfire response is shaping up this session. Well, you're absolutely right. And uh, one of the one of the favorite adages that uh, is tossed around in the legislature is that bad bill ideas come from headlines. You shouldn't be legislating just by pulling ideas from the headlines. Of course, we see that more often than we'd like. In the wake of the wildfires, the California Department of Insurance came out with a study in which they suggested a number of ways in which the state's insurance regulatory system could be modified to better allow people to ensure they were covered in a cost-effective way. Now, some of these suggestions have made their ways into bills, some have not. One that has not that is still of, of grave concern in the event it should make its way into legislation would create a system where the Department of Insurance would have the ability to approve or disapprove the models that insurers use, these models uh, for catastrophe risk that take into account climate science based on whether or not they are going to increase or decrease prices. It, it's really interesting because we see there is a uh, there's a penchant among regulators to often expand the scope of their power. And I'm not entirely sure that the Department of Insurance, as an insurance regulator, has a great deal of expertise when it comes to interpreting whether or not a catastrophe model makes a whole lot of sense. So it's, it's just sort of ironic that you hear a lot of talking points about concern for maintaining the best of climate science, and yet when it when it comes to their own authority, they're looking to be able to have the veto in that area. So I'm hopeful that we won't see that that noxious proposal. But a couple others have uh, have actually, as we say, gone across the <coughs> desk and have actually been introduced as legislation. They are they tend to be a little more minor. So for instance, you've got Assembly Bill 1797 by Assemblymember Levine, which would require insurers to conduct um, cost replacements. As estimates with each renewal. And so the idea there is you have a lot of homes in these areas which were actually underinsured relative to their value because, of course, we've been in a cycle where home prices in California have gone up and up and up. And so the thought is each year there's a renewal, the insurer would be compelled to take another look at what the estimate would be to re repair that home, to restore that home. There is a cost associated with that. There's no there's no doubt of, no doubt about it. But in wildfire prone areas, that is one approach to, to dealing with the changing nature of the risk and the changing nature of home values. Another another bill that has uh, been introduced is Assembly Bill 1722 by Assemblywoman Aguiar Curry, which would extend the timeline to rebuild and collect replacement costs from 24 to 36 months. And this is an interesting idea. And I think it, it on some
some level it makes sense because there are labor shortages in the wake of a wildfire. There are seasonal issues, right? If it happens right before winter, it's very difficult to, to restart construction. So, so facially that makes sense. One of the struggles is when you extend those timelines, you increase the risk of fraud. It can be one of the big issues that drives property insurance rates higher than they would otherwise be. So it'll be interesting to see. We've seen a total of 12 bills introduced on this topic, fire insurance in particular, thus far this session. I would imagine we'll see more. So Ian, if these proposals aren't the way to go, what free market reforms would you put forward to help those who live in the high fire risk areas affordably rebuild their homes and businesses? Well, I think there are two approaches. And I would I would say there is probably a role for the state to play. Before I get into the free market side, I think that legislators can be looking to assist Cal Fire, give it the support necessary to perform fire inspections so people understand the nature of the risk that their property faces. I think the state can also be doing more to provide grants to manage vegetation or install fire-resistant roofs. Uh, the state does a lot on earthquake retrofitting. So it's not as though there isn't some precedent for taking steps to fund mitigation in the event or, or in contemplation of disasters. So there are things that can be done by the state. But I would say you're absolutely right. The free market really has to take the lead here. And so at the end of the day, what California is really hobbled by in that sense is Proposition 103, which was passed in 1988, which created a system of property insurance regulation that is just very, very rigid and resistant to reform and modernization. So 1988, the, the cutting edge of personal entertainment was the Walkman. Well, we continue to have the Walkman equivalent of property insurance regulation in California. So we don't see the same products that our neighbors in other states see. And as a result, we tend to pay higher rates. I mean, it is so bad that the price that you are paying for insurance likely was filed in a rate filing that the department approved over a year ago. And that's in the best case scenario. It's more often closer to three years, the lag time between the price you're paying and when the filing was made. And the thing is, we have all of these really exciting new technologies that can allow insurers to charge rates and to provide discounts that reflect the risk at that very moment. And virtually everywhere else in the country, people are seeing the benefits of those technologies and those product advancements. We don't get to see that here in California. So that is where the free market could really do with a greater role in our approach to insurance regulation. So we know that two of the areas that were really most devastated by the recent fires, Santa Rosa and Santa Barbara, had some of the highest housing costs in California before the wildfires and little available supply. And now that's a hundred times worse after these wildfires. How would the legislative proposals that you're talking about here have either a positive or negative effect on existing housing supply? And in your view, how would relying on the free market better better address the critical housing shortage that people in these areas are facing today. So of the proposals that we've seen introduced in the legislature to date, I think that all of them, there would be a de minimis impact on the supply of housing one way or the other. It could be that they allow for homes to be rebuilt in areas that are more fire prone than we would otherwise like to see. And that's a problem because ultimately we want to see the, the housing supply in California go up so that prices go down and Californians are able to realize the California dream. But at the same time, if folks are allowed to build in areas and be insulated from the true cost of the risk of those areas, that's harming everyone because we understand that the worst can happen that people's lives are burned to the ground, that the human cost can be quite dramatic, and so we want to avoid that. In terms of addressing housing supply within the state, obviously loosening restrictions on development, that's, that's very important, but I think it has to go hand in hand with making sure people experience the true cost of that construction and the true cost of the risk in, in where they build. I'd also say that specifically in the wake of disaster, one of the things that we can be doing within this state to ensure that people are able to rebuild quickly, get back on their feet, is to liberalize 
satisfies some of the licensing requirements associated with contracting so that folks can come in, get to work really very quickly in a cost-effective manner and, and get those homes rebuilt again. Um, California, unfortunately, is a state with very, very onerous occupational licensing requirements. And so we we don't look kindly on folks coming in from, from other states. That's, that's part of a larger conversation about occupational licensing reform that has to take place. But particularly, we could see those licenses requirements be suspended or have a safe harbor created in the wake of disaster. We don't have to go to the question of just, do we get rid of the license? We can just suspend requirements in very specific areas just to make sure people can get back on their feet. So Ian, a natural temptation of government following a wildfire is for government to attack so-called price gouging. Uh, PRI's Carrie Jackson recently wrote a piece about this for our Right by the Bay blog. Carrie makes the case that the free market, even with naturally rising prices due to supply and demand actually does a better job of getting needed supplies and services to the affected areas and government controls. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I tend to agree. I thought that was a really a very insightful piece and 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 a, a little brave actually just because this can be a topic uh, that that elicits strong strong reaction, strong emotion. Doubly so given that we're in California and we've just had a lot of these wildfires, but one of the big issues that we see develop in the wake of disaster is hoarding. And that is a function of people not seeing the true price of goods reflect in the area where there is a shortage. And ultimately, hoarding can lead to even more severe shortages that prevent people from getting the, the goods necessary to either sustain them or to assist them in rebuilding. So I could not agree more that when the state steps in to prevent so-called price gouging, or which is to say to prevent the market from reflecting the true price of these goods in these areas, it's doing more harm than good. It's it's just making the problem worse. Well, with all of this depressing talk, I think we need to wind down a little bit. And we love on this uh, podcast to nothing more than having a glass of wine or something while discussing public policy. So with that spirit in mind, please share with our listeners your recommendation for either uh, your favorite wine that they should try or uh, other adult beverage. So I find wine talk awfully intimidating simply because I was not acculturated to Northern California and its wine and, it, and its wine culture until far too late in my life, I feel like, to truly appreciate it. So I found that going to law school in Eugene, Oregon, where they have just fantastic breweries, that you cannot miss if you go with a Ninkasi IPA. Now, that brand is slowly making its way into Northern California. If you see it on tap, you really ought to go for it. They do some fantastic work there. Finally, Ian, tell our listeners how they can get a copy of the study and learn more about your work. And of course, follow the R Street Institute on social media. Well, we are on every major social media platform, uh, with the exception of Snapchat. I'm not sure that we're there yet, but uh, you can follow, you can find our website. We are www.rstreet.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We have a, a an excitable Twitter presence. I think it's fair to say we're really big in the, the GIF game these days. You can follow me on on Twitter at IA about CA. And uh, I don't know that I'm the coolest to follow on Twitter, but uh, I am persistent. Thanks, Ian. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks again to our guest, Ian Adams, and to Tim Anaya. To find out more about R Street Institute, go to their website at rstreet.org. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to